This is Ian Hartley. I am Warren Kay. And I am Sasha Steenbergen. Welcome to the Rediscovering God Dialogue. We invite you to join us as we endeavor to see Him more clearly. And love Him more dearly while following Him more nearly. Today, as we continue in Genesis, we are now in chapter 21. It's a very engaging part of the story as uh, Isaac is born to parents who are elderly. Um, I once learned of a young man who um, his parents were were older when he was born, and, and he <laughs> he made a comment to them one day. He said, I never imagined that my parents would be this old. <laughs> like he had thoughts about this kind of thing. And so maybe Isaac thought that about his parents too. But uh, Sasha, why don't you take us into the first verse of chapter 21? The Lord kept his word and did for Sarah exactly what he had promised. She became pregnant and she gave birth to a son for Abraham in his old age. This happened at just the time God had said it would. So this is affirmation for the fulfillment of the promise the Lord had made 25 years earlier. Mm. Wow. Um, and then, of course, the previous year, these uh, three gentlemen had showed up and they talked about that uh, next year, this time, Sarah's going to have a baby. Then, of course, they also talked about Sodom and Gomorrah and their destruction. Mm -hmm. So they, uh, we often wonder why Sarah did not have a baby until she was 90 years old. And various explanations are given. One, the Lord uh, prevented a pregnancy for his own good reasons, which he didn't tell us. No. It was part of the devil's plan to prevent the coming of the Messiah, and he would just as well have had no children through Sarah. Uh, and then we can take a more pragmatic approach and say, well, Sarah had a problem, a fertility problem, and that's all there is to it, and her pregnancy at 90 was a miracle. Mm. Mm-hmm. So, you know, there are many barren women mentioned in the Bible. And uh, we'll look at just a few of them. First of all, three of the four matriarchs were barren. We're talking about Sarah. And then her son Isaac married Rebecca, also had a problem. And then uh, it was Isaac's uh, son. Joseph? Jo no. Esau and Jacob? Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, Jacob married uh, Rachel. Rachel. His favorite. And she mm -hmm. had a... Mm -hmm. So, um, there, there just seems to be a, a thing running in this line here. And uh, then we know about Hannah the mother of the prophet Samuel, and she had a problem. Um, the anonymous mother of Samson had a problem. Maybe we should read that one in Judges 13. Verse 2. In those days, a man named Manoah from the tribe of Dan lived in the town of Zorah. His wife was unable to become pregnant, and they had no children. The angel of the Lord appeared to Manoah's wife and said, even though you have become unable to have children, you will soon become pregnant and give birth to a son. Yes, yeah, so that's very clear. Uh, the, the problem was there. Um, and I'm waiting for Sasha to comment on the fact that she's never given a name. <laughs> Uh, I feel like there's there's too much there 
to unpack <laughs> in this short time. <laughs> yeah, very good. So um, the great women of Shunam, also called a Shunamite, uh, also has a problem. Second Kings 4 from 8. Second Kings chapter 4 from verse 8. One day Elisha went to the town of Shunam. A wealthy woman lived there, and she urged him to come to her home for a meal. After that, whenever he passed that way, he would stop there for something to eat. She said to her husband, I am sure this man stops in time to time is a holy man of God. Let's build a little room for him on the roof and furnish it with a bed, a table, a chair, and a lamp. Then he will have a place to stay whenever he comes by. One day, Elisha returned to Shunem, and he went up to his upper room to rest. He said to his servant, Gehazi, tell the woman from Shunem, I want to speak with her. When she appeared, Elisha said to Gehesh, Gehazi, tell her, we appreciate the kind concern you have shown us. What can we do for you? Can we put in a good word for you to the king or to the commander of the army? No, she replied. My family takes good care of me. Later, Elisha said to Gehazi, what can we do for her? Gehazi replied, she doesn't have a son and her husband is an old man. Call her back, Elisha told him. When the woman returned, Elisha said to her as, he stood in, as she stood in the doorway, next year at this time, you will be holding a son in your arms. Thank you. Um, well, there's more. Um, we've actually uh, talked about the next one here, where Abimelech household all become barren. Uh, Genesis 20, 17 to 18 was in our last podcast. Mm -hmm. Warren, if you can read that. 17 and 18. Mm -hmm. Then Abraham prayed to God, and God healed Abimelech, his wife, and his female servants, so they could have children. For the Lord had caused all the women to be infertile because of what happened with Abraham's wife, Sarah. Mm. So, uh, I just can't help myself but remind you of the injustice of having Abimelech's uh, woman uh, becoming barren because Abraham had lied about Sarah. It's really, and then it's attributed to God as causing it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Anyway, we talked about that in the last podcast, so we're not going to rehash all that again. We have Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist, who is barren. Um, we need to read at least part of the story, Luke 1, verse 5, and onwards. When Herod was king of Judea, there was a Jewish priest named Zechariah. He was a member of the priestly order of Abijah, and his wife Elizabeth was also from the priestly line of Aaron. Zechariah and Elizabeth were righteous in God's eyes, careful to obey all of the Lord's commandments and regulations. They had no children because Elizabeth was unable to conceive, and they were both very old. Thank you. Notice that uh, this is a conundrum for a Jew that they are obedient and committed and still they have no children. Right. Yeah. Doing all the right things. Yes. So uh, it's a mystery for them. And then, um, look, Israel as a nation was barren for 1,500 years because the Messiah was to come through Israel and he never showed up for 1,500 years. So there's not only barrenness for individuals, but also for the nation as a whole. Um, and then the Messiah is conceived by the Spirit and born to Mary. And Luke 1, 26 onwards, Warren. And in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. 
Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Thank you. So the Messiah arrives. And, uh, so what do you make of all this, Sasha? You're a woman. I've never <laughs> been a woman. So... Yeah, I'm just I'm just uh, finding it interesting that not a lot gets shared about the women. Uh, however, when they're not giving the children that are needed for the lineages to continue, then we are are sure to mention it. <laughs> um, yeah, but just thinking about what they must have been feeling like, it must have been a tough uh, experience. I know, obviously, uh, you know, in today's culture. Um, it's, you know, unbelievably painful if somebody is, you know, trying to create a family and can't, um, uh, but I can only imagine with their status, uh, back then, um, yeah, I feel like there would be added complica uh, complexities to that. Yeah. It uh, called into question the whole, uh, w the women's value. Yeah. Their place in society. Yeah. Yeah, it's really traumatic for the woman. Yeah. Well, let's get back to the narrative and read verses 3 to 5. And Abraham named their son Isaac. Eight days after Isaac was born, Abraham circumcised him as God had commanded. Abraham was a hundred years old when Isaac was born. Wow. That laconic statement, he was a hundred years old. <laughs> <laughs> Isaac means he laughs. Abraham is a hundred years old, and the first promise of having a child that we know of was made when he was 75. He has waited for 25 years, at least, for this son. And uh, Sarah also laughs uh, with joy. Uh, verses 6 and 7. And Sarah declared, God has brought me laughter. All who hear about this will laugh with me. Who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse a baby? Yet I have given Abraham a son in his old age. Mm. So having a baby at 90 is unheard of. Mm. Or have I missed something? And nursing a baby at this age is also a stretch for the imagination. Mm -hmm. And while she is happy, the narrative indicates that her happiness includes what she has done for Abraham. Sarah has given Abraham a wife in Hagar. Now she can give him a son personally. Mm -hmm. There's this, I mean, her, interesting, her whole attitude about Abraham. It's almost like she worships him. I've mm -hmm. now been able to give him a son. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, our culture has really changed, hasn't it? Yeah. So we're on, uh, we now come to, uh, there's all this laughter and happiness, and now the table's reversed. Yeah. We come to Hagar and Ishmael are sent away. Uh, chapter 21, verse 8. To 10 to actually to 11. When Isaac when... grew up and was about to be weaned, Abraham prepared a huge feast to celebrate the occasion. But Sarah saw Ishmael, the son of Abraham, and her Egypt Egyptian servant Hagar making fun of her son Isaac. So she turned to Isaac, so, so she turned to Abraham and demanded, Get rid of this slave woman and her son. He is not going to share the inheritance with my son, Isaac. I won't have it. This upset Abraham very much because Ishmael was his son. So for 13 plus years, the household of Abraham had accepted Ishmael as Abraham's heir. But with the birth of Isaac, all this had changed. It was a devastating, traumatic change for the expectations 
of especially Hagar and Ishmael. Perhaps this is part of the motivation for Ishmael to tease Isaac. Both sons are Abrams, and it will be difficult for him to do as Sarah demands. A 13-year-old boy is determining his identity, and this will now be shattered by the birth of Isaac. So he teased Isaac, made fun of him. So I tried to imagine uh, what this meant um, for Abraham. Uh, he knew this to be true, but he hadn't acted on it. And now Sarah confronts him uh, on it. Um, and she's adamant. I mean, you, you, you get the, you almost get the body language here. Get rid of that slave woman and her son. He's not going to share the inheritance with my son, Isaac. I won't have it. I was just thinking, sorry, I was just thinking about, because uh, it mentioned that um, Isaac was about to be weaned. And I'm just trying to imagine, I don't know uh, ages wise, but I know that in other cultures, uh, children are weaned much later than here. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm picturing him at least around four years of age or something like that, actually. Mm. And you know, I'm just, you know, picture him running around innocent as can be just having a, you know, a ball. And Isa, our, um, Sarah has obviously been watching this interchange all the time. Like she's had a really close eye on how Ishmael is treating her son. And of course, as we can only imagine with the status of having his mother be um, one of the servants anyways, that there is such a blueprint already put on Ishmael for where he sits in the world because he's so in, caught in between these two worlds of status. Um, and so I can just imagine him acting this out somehow, trying to find his own place, you know, and it just seems so heartbreaking for this dynamic now. Yeah, it pains, pains my heart. You, th you think it could be as much as four years after his birth, the weaning? Yeah, I do. But even if it was younger, I mean, I'm just trying to imagine, you know, what kind of teasing could be done, you know, at age two, like if he was toddling around. Like if he's a little older, he I can imagine there might be some mischievousness going already, you know, and sort of doing a little bit this and that, um, you know, trying to imagine the dynamic there. Yeah. Well, and, and there's just the typical uh, sibling rivalry and jealousy. He's been the center of attention for all these years. And now this young child comes along and, and he gets set yeah. aside. And uh, yeah, not a good scene. Yeah. Yeah. So um, let me ask this question. What does this passage tell us about the strength of Abram's leadership? Well, it kind of lays it in question. I mean, he he doesn't take a, a leadership role, you know, and, and kind of says he doesn't stand up to Sarah, that's for sure. Uh, he's willing to to send his child off and and her mother, his mother off uh, to be banished who knows whether they will survive or not and and uh, you know, that's a pretty drastic move for on his part so in the previous uh, time that there was this confrontation between sarah and abram he had responded she's your slave do what you want to with her mm. and sarah made it so unbearable for hagar that she ran away uh, this time, uh, Sarah uh, is far more demanding of Abraham. It, it's difficult to answer the question because um, often, you know, uh, situations arise and resolve themselves uh, if you just are a little patient. Other times, you have to act and do something. Uh, it's not going to resolve itself with time. And 
takes uh, wisdom to know the difference between these two responses. Mm. Yeah. So uh, apparently Abraham talked to God about this. It was really a problem for him. So verses 12 to 13. But God told Abraham, don't be upset over the boy and your servant. Do whatever Sarah tells you, for Isaac is the son through whom your descendants will be counted. But I will also make a nation of the descendants of Hagar's son, because he is your son too. So this would have been some consolation to Abraham, um, that they weren't going to perish if he sent them away. Uh, but that... Uh, Ishmael will have many descendants uh, and God would honor them because they were also Abram's offspring. So in chapter 25, we actually have a record of the fulfillment of this promise. Um, maybe we can read a few verses from verse 12 onwards. Genesis 25 from verse 12 onwards. This is the account of the family of Ishmael, the son of Abraham through Hagar, Sarah's Egyptian servant. Here is a list by their names and clans of Ishmael's descendants. The oldest was Neboeth, followed by Kedar, Abbeel, Mibsham, and Mishpah. <laughs> You haven't That's read quite a list of names here. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. These 12 sons Good. of Ishmael became founders of the 12 tribes named after them, listed according to the places they settled and camped. Mm. I didn't realize he had 12 sons. Yes. Yeah, parallel to Isaac's yeah. descendants. Hmm. So I just remind you that Genesis is an account of where all these people came from, mainly uh, uh, the Hebrews, the Jews, however you want to call them. Uh, uh, but then also some of the surrounding nations. For instance, we get the story of Lot and his two daughters. And from them, we get the Edomites and the Moabites and so on. So, it's really an explanation of all these descendants of Abraham and uh, that family. Mm -hmm. So Hagar is referred to as a servant repeatedly. And, uh, but there's a consolation for Abraham's broken heart in the promise that uh, Ishmael will also have 12 significant descendants. So the weaning party was meant to be pure joy. Uh, and now it's bittersweet uh, because of the consequences of this conflict. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the next couple of verses, are, well, actually the next verse. Mm -hmm. um, let's read verse 14. So Abraham got up early the next morning prepared food and a container of water and strapped them on Hagar's shoulders. Then he sent her away with their son and she wandered aimlessly in the wilderness of Beersheba. So um, there's a lot of emotion packed into this verse. You know, the Hebrew storytelling is usually very flat in terms of emotion, but not this verse. This verse is really exceptional. Look, why does he get up early in the morning? Well, he's busy preparing food. And why is he preparing the food? This is unusual. Mm -hmm. I, I think he wanted to deal with it before Sarah got uh, into the scene. Yeah. You know, when you have a, a very strong emotional attachment with somebody, uh, you don't want the public around. Mm-hmm with uh, separation like this. And there's there's just so much care. Um, you know, he, he prepared food, a container of water. He he straps it onto her shoulders. Like, it's, it, it's like, 
I, I'm doing this, but I don't want to be doing this. Yeah. I'm having, I, I don't know. I, I just don't know, like at this point in time, Abraham, like what kind of a camp does he have? Like, does he have, is he wealthy? Where is he at with his, you know, place in the world? Uh, it seems really surprising to me that he hasn't, you know, because we hear stories like, you know, where um, uh, Jacob, you know, he sends uh, servants and cattle and goods and whatnot in different places and stuff. To me, it seems so hard to believe that Abraham would not have prepared provisions in the sense of somebody to go with them, you know, some animals uh, some sort of a, a camel or something, if they had that to go with something to set them up with so that his son, um, at the very least, his son would have something to make his way in the world with. I, I don't know. It, it just seems surprising to me that that's all we're getting a backpack on this back of this woman who has, uh, served him for 13 plus years um, as potentially uh, a a partner in some way, um, and and a son that she did not feel welcome to have at the beginning, anyways. Even uh, it just seems really sad to me that this is all he's a, doing. You make a good point. Uh, I, he's a rich man. Uh, he he could have provided that assistance for him. It, it just seems so desolate to me that this backpack and this boy are headed out of camp on their own with nothing. I mean, I don't know. Maybe they did have more. I don't know. But Well, as the story, as it progresses, um, seems to indicate that they didn't have any more resource than what she was carrying. Yeah. Uh, the emotional pain for Abraham is palpable in the statement. He sent her away with their son. Yeah. And the emotion of the separation is heightened with she wandered aimlessly in the wilderness of Beersheba. Now, the, this whole narrative uh, is there to tell you how difficult this was mm -hmm. for both of them. So Hagar had been sent away before <clears throat> by Sarah, uh, and the angel of the Lord had sent her back to live with Abram and Sarah. But this time the separation is permanent. Mm -hmm. We're on verse 15 and 16. When the water was gone, she put the boy in the shade of a bush. Then she went and sat down by herself about a hundred yards I don't want to watch the boy die, she said, as she burst into tears. How old is this boy? Yeah, you know, you get the idea. You think that this boy is just an infant, but he's, he's you know, 13, 14 years old. Yeah, and if the weaning was four years, um, he could be 17. Yeah, it just seems mind-boggling, you know, like a, a container of water and he knows the land that they live in i don't know i mean you know unless abraham goes you know i had a personal chat with god and god assured me that he's going to provide for food and water and he's going to take care of all their needs but somehow to me uh there's no regard for life at all if he if he knows where they live it's very different than here where you could, you know, go into a YMCA and, you know, fill your water bottle up with a, you know, from a container there. But this just seems like he sent them away with nothing. It's a really tough feeling. So they're both suffering from dehydration. And uh, he he's young. Um, how old do you think Sarah is? Well, I would, she's somewhere. You mean, Hagar? you mean Hagar? I mean Hagar, thank you. Mm -hmm. Let's say she conceived at 20 and the boy is 15 years old. She's she's 35. Mm -hmm. 
at least. And uh, the boy is 17. Uh, so I would think that a 17 year old boy would have far more strength, physical resilience than his mother at 35. Yeah, you think he would be taking care of his mother? Yeah. Do you know this, this story, as I was thinking of it, uh, is prophetic of another boy whose mother was around and had to watch him die. Mm. And he calls out, I thirst. Mm. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's the bad news. We're on 17. Yes, some good news. 17 and 18. But God heard the boy crying, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven. Hagar, what's wrong? Do not be afraid. God has heard the boy crying as he lies there. Go to him and comfort him, for I will make a great nation from his descendants. You know, the, these stories are told in such an interesting way. You just have <laughs> to stop and try and figure this out. So why didn't God hear uh, Hagar cry? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Because now he's talking to Hagar, mm -hmm. not to the son. Um, maybe because uh, it's couched in the language of Hagar's concern for her son. So it's a direct response to her concern. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know... Um, when God hears, he acts. When Jesus sees, he acts. Mm -hmm. uh, when, when these uh, verbs are used, uh, it's preparing you for action. Mm -hmm. mm. We're on verse 19. Then God opened Hagar's eyes, and she saw a well full of water. She quickly filled her water container and gave the boy a drink. So, yeah, there's another conundrum for me. Um, well, what's wrong with me? I, I, why can't I just read these stories and go with the flow? <laughs> <laughs> she sees the well, and she takes water to Ishmael. I would have said to him, hey, Ishmael, there's a well. Go and get <laughs> some water for yourself and me. <laughs> oh, well that's because you're not a mother <laughs> uh, thank you for that uh, very brief appropriate instruction to me <laughs> <laughs> so maybe there's another parallel here um, that uh, Jesus didn't email instructions to us he came and brought us the water of mm. life yeah. Um, there is a way to comfort other people and one size does not fit all it takes insight and wisdom to discern the appropriate response to raw grief mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know uh, at the group last night uh, we were talking about how to comfort somebody who's experienced great grief and one person said um, when I lost my husband and people wanted to hug me, I told them, don't touch me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's different. And mm -hmm. to find the appropriate way is, is sometimes uh, challenging. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hmm. We're on verse 20 and 21. Is it my turn? Yeah. 20. And God was with the boy as he grew in the wilderness. He became a skillful archer, and he settled in the wilderness of Paran. His mother arranged for him to marry a woman from the land of Egypt. So that tells you a little bit about uh, where Hagar's um, loyalty was. She marries him off to an Egyptian. Uh, woman, somebody of her own culture, mm -hmm. maybe a relative, uh, but she doesn't identify with Abrams 
Babylon. Yeah. Yeah, she she married him with one of her people. Yeah. So Beersheba is up in the northeast, uh, near Gaza. Everybody knows where Gaza is today. Uh, that's where Hagar wandered when Sarah sent her away. Ishmael settles in the wilderness of Paran, which is in the middle east of the Sinai Peninsula. So there are many uh, wildernesses in that peninsula. And uh, it's a barren, difficult place to live. But he survived. And mm. uh, had 12 princes mm. in his line. Yeah. So what's your takeaway from this story? The thing that jumps out at me is the... Um... You know, both both sons of Abraham uh, are special, and 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 have you know, and and are very prolific. They they begin a whole nation, and uh, and and that's just kind of fascinating that it wasn't just the one son, the chosen son, but Ishmael was was um, blessed in a way that uh, you know he had a multitude of children and and grew to become a great nation as well. Yeah, and I'm just <clears throat> um, thinking about the trauma that is uh, inevitably going to be passed down from the experiences of Hagar and raising her son in the wilderness and all all that went with this story um, and the navigating that both of them are going to have to do. Obviously, they had you know, they were in survival mode for, I think, probably a long time. And, it, you know, when it talks about him being a skillful archer, I think that was out of necessity. So mm. um, I think, yeah, just a lot of feelings in this story. You hear these stories of families not getting along. Uh, and I guess it's part of living in a sinful world that you just naively think that, well, your children are all going to get along with you and each other and live happily ever after. It. But that's a fairy tale. It happens yeah. to practically every family on earth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is a good place to stop. Uh, we get into a other, an, another whole narrative with the rest of the chapter. Nice. Let's pray together. Dear God, thank you for caring for Hagar and Ishmael. Well, that our rejection of people is not your rejection of people. And that you came into this world to save the world and not to condemn it. You're wonderful in your unconditional love. How we envy you all. Amen. 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 of our podcast on our website uh, as well as the PDF document that we've been using so you can follow along or at least see all the passages and so that website is rediscoveringgod.ca and on there there is the, the, the PDF document the uh, link for the podcast as well as our YouTube link we are now on YouTube so if you want to see us live then you can go and watch it on youtube wonderful and we'd also love to invite you to our monday evening zoom discussion where ian and warren lead us out and um, we are currently going through the podcast uh, where we get to have discussion and really dive in a little deeper and get our um our, our most pressing questions answered 
Um, it's a really wonderful time of fellowship and connection with the group. Um, we share in community and resources as well. We'd really love to have you join us. We're going to be meeting um, at 6.30 Mountain Standard Time. Uh, you just add in the link 403-506-9201. We'd love to see you. And if you'd like to connect with us, you can reach us at rediscoveringgod2020 at gmail.com. Send us an email. We'd love to hear from you and know how this journey of rediscovering the God that Jesus knew is changing your life. Take care.